Steffen, you're still young, but you're old enough to still remember the old days of communication. So in other words, the, in other words, the, the world without Twitter and without Facebook and so on and so forth. Nowadays, social media seem to be an, an integral part of your, and, uh, yours and Angela Merkel's uh, communication strategy. How would you describe this paradigm shift that took place within the last five to six years? I would say the basic concept of government communication has always been the same probably since we've had a democratic state. It's you put out information, you explain, you tell your story, ideally you give to an informed citizen what he or she needs to make an informed decision. That's probably been the job description for every German government spokesman. If my predecessors came back today, I think they'd be amazed at the speed at which we have to react, the 24-7 barrage of, of opinion, comment, criticism that we live in. They'd be amazed what degree of transparency is expected of us. I think they'd be delighted how easy it is for us to spread a story to all corners of the world. And they'd probably be shocked at some other aspects of digital communication, you know, the sheer aggression that's out there in online. Those are the frame, that's the framework, those are the conditions that I work in. I knew the world before. I wouldn't trade my world of communication now for what was there before. When you came into office in 2010, you immediately introduced social media as a tool for political communication. How were the reactions to this move within the government? When I started working for the government and for the chancellor in summer of 2010, we, we kind of looked around and, and, and saw what other, com what other countries were doing. The Elysee, the Kremlin, Number 10 Downing Street, the White House, the Pope, and we decided it's Sorry, never a good... Who had, who had the best social media strategy well, by then? the Vatican aren't bad. The White House are <laughs> leaders of the pack. Um, we thought it's never a good idea to fall too far behind the Pope in terms of communication strategies. <laughs> so we decided to A, introduce Twitter, then Instagram, then Facebook, YouTube, and all that sort of thing. Initial reaction by some members of the media in Berlin were very bizarre. They thought it was a fad. This strange new government spokesman has funny ideas. Some thought it was a threat. I think they've all got used to it now. You have to think that in, back in 2010, most German journalists weren't on Twitter. They weren't, um, they, they are now. And you know, they quote me on Twitter, they, they use what we put out there as if we had said it in a press conference or in some other um, old fashioned kind of way. And I think what we keep telling them and what, th there still is some suspicion that we're doing all this to somehow uh, evade them to somehow circumvent, uh, you know, their gatekeeper um, function. And I keep telling them, whatever we do in terms of digital communication, social media, we, we, we do on top of everything that we've always done. We still give press conferences, hand out brochures, you know, uh, town hall meetings, all that sort of thing. There is an added digital communication. It doesn't threaten anybody. Does the content of a message define the channel through which you push it out? In other words, is there still some, some hierarchy of importance, such as agenda setting in print, whereas mm. news in Twitter? No, when we have an important message, we go out on all the channels that we have. I think it's the other way around. It's the channel that shapes the contents. What we had to learn when we became more and more active in social media is that the little video that you make for YouTube may be totally unsuitable for Facebook. Uh, the message needs to be shaped in a different way for Twitter than for, I don't know, another social medium. Um, so, so this is, it took us some, some getting used to it to decide and to make that distinction. Which network, which platform, which channel of communication requires which approach. Do you think, and not speaking just about, uh, uh, I mean, your experience within the German government, but also arranging from, from, from other uh, uh, countries, did, you, did it become easier for governments to manipulate public opinion? Well, as I said, I'd like to think of us as not being in the business of manipulation. Um, well, I think it is 
<laughs> Let's say influence. The, the internet and digital communication is neither good nor bad. It's, it's, what you, it's how you use it. Um, it can be used as a, as a terrific, liberating force. It can be used for oppression and for spreading, for spreading um, rumors, conspiracy theories. It can be used to, to peddle the most outlandish ideas. Um, I think it's, it's how we use it. And, and I believe that online, we need to fight for our basic values and stand up for our basic values of decency just as much as we have to do that you know, in the real world. Speaking of how, how you use these, these tools we were speaking about, one of the nice, really nice things with digital communication is the fact that it is not a one-way communication anymore. So do you use it for feedback as well? Do you use it for some kind of testing the public's opinion? Well, this is very important to us, um, the fact that we get a lot back from people. Their feedback, their criticism, their comments, um, have an influence on us, on the messages and the kind of messages that we put out. Um, the Chancellor's had, in her last term, she had, uh, or in her previous term, I should say, um, she had... Uh, <laughs> um, that was in a very important No, no, that was the previous one. Now Listen we're in the carefully. current one. <laughs> um, she has had a, a, a Bürger Dialog, a Citizens Dialog, um, which was online and offline and and you know there's an awful lot of um, will to participate out there there's uh, so much experience and wisdom in the citizenry and they want this is probably different from ages ago they want to participate they want to contribute they want us to take in their advice their 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 recommendations their suggestions so that's what we've had this um, this uh, citizens dialogue for we're having another one now um, the, the conclusions of which will go all the way to the cabinet and then hopefully be acted on. So this is very important, yes. So on, what, if what? I may one, say one more thing, because you said testing public opinion. I think it's very important not to mistake the public opinion as it's voiced in social media or the digital world um, for a true representation of public opinion. Certainly speaking for Germany, those are two different kettle of fish. Um, it is a part of public opinion, um, a particularly vocal and eloquent part probably, but there's an awful lot of people out there being equally interested in politics but not making their voices heard in social media and we have to keep that in mind. One, just one gossip question. Does Angela Merkel do social media herself? And maybe you can tell us um, the name under which she's doing that. Um, as a party chairman, she has a terrifically successful Facebook account, and I'm very envious of those numbers because I have nothing to do with the party work. Um, in her government work, no, she doesn't. She's got me for that, basically, and my colleagues. Okay. Um, but she follows it a lot. She's, she's extremely interested in all things digital. And, um, and uh, the digital agenda is something that's very much at the heart of her thinking. Okay, so maybe there's a chance of welcoming her next year on the stage then. I'll tell her what the experience was like. Okay, however, there, let's speak about current affairs as well, Steffen. Um, let's speak about the, the, the famous, or some say infamous selfie, which a refugee did with Angela Merkel. Maybe we can see it um, here on the screen. Um, that was shot a few months ago. Um, some of Angela Merkel's political opponents claimed that this selfie became something like, a, like an invitation for refugees to come to Germany. What's your opinion about that? What do you answer those guys? Well, what you see is the Chancellor being friendly. Um, nothing more and nothing less. There's never been an invitation and hundreds of thousands of people don't come to Germany, undertake a, a very dangerous, sometimes deadly voyage because of a selfie. Um, and we didn't welcome so many of these refugees because of an invitation, but because of the laws of this country, the, uh, the Geneva Refugee Convention that we've subscribed to, as every European state has, and because of our basic humanitarian 
principles that, that we believe in as Germans and as Europeans. That's the case, I believe. Um, so, very nice of you, thank you. Um, it's an interesting case, though, because, of course, this selfie has traveled across the world. And that just goes to show, and this has been a learning experience, um, that whatever we do here can travel uh, and make news and make waves, sometimes completely taken out of context, sometimes in a very distorted fashion, in a very dis different, di distant country. Another example was when the German interior minister, Thomas de Maizière, in the late summer said that the calculations were that we would probably uh, have to expect 800,000 refugees arriving in Germany in 2015. Um, the, the news that, that arrived in Afghanistan, for instance, or that was received in Afghanistan was, oh, they're waiting for 800,000 of us. And of course, human traffickers used it that way. So distortion of, of, of news taken out of context, of, of pictures taken out of context, that's something we have to, to bear in mind, we have to, to work with, we have to adapt ourselves to, which is why our diplomatic missions all across the world now you know, have to be very vigilant. They, they, they make counter um, information um, offensives, if you want. Uh, they, the, the, the German embassy in Afghanistan has uh, started something called rumors about Germany. We have to take that into account. Um, but that photo is a chancellor being friendly, full stop. So, and she's famous. Uh, sorry, can I say one more thing? Sure. Okay, sorry. Um, because it just comes to my mind. She's, she's famously said when she was asked, do you regret taking or allowing that selfie to be taken? She's famously said that if she now has to apologize for making a friendly face to a person in an emergency situation, then this would not be her country. I think uh, that's what... Uh, and of course, this is her country. Why? Because hundreds of thousands of people in overwhelming gestures of generosity and, and I would say, civic behavior have, have done the same thing. Since ancient times, you just mentioned that true information, whether it's true information or false information, was always part of warfare. I have two questions. What is the role of social media in today's wars generally? And second, maybe you, although it's probably a delicate issue for you, but maybe you could emphasize this phenomena regarding the civil war in the, in the Ukraine, especially the Kremlin's hybrid warfare. <laughs> Well, as you say, um, propaganda, disinformation, that's as old as human conflict. But of course, the digital possibilities of communication have, have elevated this to new heights. And, and of course, the, 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 the conflict in Ukraine is, is an interesting case study. Western media, Western governments, the German government, our, our social network sites, have been um, attacked, have been inundated with, um, with posts uh, that weren't just pro-Russian, pro-separatist posts, that weren't just an outpouring of, you know, Russian citizens' opinions, but if you looked very, very carefully, you saw patterns, you saw um, a degree of organization behind it. I don't know who really is behind it, but you've probably read um, the stories that have been in the press on the uh, so-called troll factory in St. Petersburg, um, where hundreds of, of young um, people work and, and, and churn out this kind of propaganda round the clock. It's something that we have to take into account. It's, um, it's something we have to, to at least know about. We cannot answer with the same kind of methods. We're a democratic state, we wouldn't do that. But I think we have to know what's out there and, and brace ourselves. In some recent polls, we've learned, uh, to put it mildly, of slightly dropping approval rates for Angela Merkel as German Chancellor. So that leads me to my last question, Stefan. Jay Carney, who spoke for President Barack Obama for, for quite a long time, and like you, he was a very well-respected journalist before he went into politics. Now Jay Carney is speaking for Amazon. 
If you look at all these internet giants here, could you imagine a career in that business as well? <laughs> Uh, very nice of you to worry about me, but no reason. Um, <laughs> that's what Jay Carney does now. Yes, wow. he's with Amazon. Wow. Um, he's always been a very good colleague. I'm sure he's great for Amazon. Um, no, you know, there's no reason to worry about me, and I, I couldn't think of anything more fulfilling right now than to do what I do, professionally fulfilling. Um, and I'd really like to carry on contributing my bit to... Um, the success of the Chancellor's policies, because I think they're right for Germany and they're right for Europe. I sound like a government spokesman, I'm sorry, but um, you are. that's what I am. Out of conviction, I'd like to stay for some time. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, much Stefan, and big a round of applause for Stefan and Seibert. <laughs> Thank you.